but they do get a little taste of interacting with the Unix shell. Um, and the other goal was to um, learn some of the key algorithms and techniques that are used in physics specifically and some of the other physical scientists. And we'll show you uh, a list of these topics shortly. Uh, this was part of the syllabus that we presented to the students, showing the various course components and how we would weight them in the students' creed. So the modules, uh, they were assigned to read outside of class ahead of time. These were posted um, either on the server on which they did their computation or on the course Moodle site, uh, depending on the format of the particular module. And there were homework exercises um, I should say exercises associated with each module, and uh, the students would solve the exercise and document what they were doing, and that was 40% of the grade. Uh, we also asked them to come up with one assessment question for each module that we might be able to use in future versions of these modules as a way of assessing students who work through the modules later on. So when we break these modules up into uh, their individual cells and import them into other courses, uh, we'd like to have various ways of assessing how well the students have mastered the material in the module. Uh, one of them is by doing the exercises, but another way we thought was by having these assessment questions, which for the most part would be multiple choice or true, false, or fill in the blank type questions related to their How did you attract students to the course? Or, or did it didn't fulfill some requirement. It, uh, it didn't fulfill. Uh, well, it, it did fulfill uh, a requirement as a course in the physics major for us. I guess I should mention that um, we had 17 students in the course. Nine of them were from Bryn Mawr. Eight were from Haverford, uh, which is just a mile down the road. And Haverford and Bryn Mawr students take a lot of upper level courses at the other school. Um, and we didn't do anything in particular to attract them to this course. In fact, I was expecting a smaller enrollment. Uh, and we had initially capped the course at 14 to try to make it a little, a little more manageable. Uh, but I think the students just realized that these skills would be very useful for them. And in fact, uh, recently when we've done surveys of our alumni, uh, the number one uh, um, component of their experience here that they thought could have been strengthened or that they felt was missing was a computational component because we hadn't been offering a course like this with any consistency uh, till recent till now. Uh, so we didn't have to do anything to attract them. They didn't know what they were getting into, I think, when they signed up for the course because there are all these other elements to it. But they all seemed to engage with them and uh, we didn't have any trouble. Um, term project was 20%. That consisted of an in-class presentation uh, and a written paper. And I'll, we'll say a little bit more about that later on. Um, as Liz mentioned, there were journal entries that we asked the students to do pretty regularly. Some of them involved just giving us feedback on the module, what worked, what didn't work. Uh, some of them involved reflection questions that we posed to the students in the class. Um, and then there was a class partition participation component, which really didn't distinguish students at all because they all participated pretty actively uh, during class. And then the scientist profiles that Liz mentioned and that we'll see examples of shortly. Uh, so again, the concept is that we have these modularized, more or less self-contained lessons on specific numerical techniques. Um, most of them, but not all of them, yet contain what I call the breakpoints, which are just quick checks of understanding of what they just read. They all include exercises that involve applying what they learned in the module. Um, and those exercises could involve writing code from scratch or applying code that they've been given or that they had written previously to some physics-related problem of interest. Um, and the modules took various forms. Some were constructed as PDFs. Some were these IPython notebooks. I haven't really decided if I want to format them all uniformly going forward. That's a decision that has to be made yet. Uh, but I've been referring to these IPython notebooks. Liz mentioned them too. Let me say a little bit more about those. Um, as Liz said, 
uh, this system runs on, uh, in our case, a standalone desktop computer. Um, and it runs on what's called a Jupyter server. This Jupyter project was funded by the NSF. And it can run not only Python and associated libraries, but other languages like R and Julio, which is a computer scientists here use. Uh, and these notebooks allow text and images, HTML, LaTeX, and executable code all to be integrated into one environment, one document. So let me show you an example of that. Uh, so, when you uh, get an account on one of these machines, uh, your sort of main page looks like this. This is just running in Firefox browser. It will run in other browsers as well. And um, it just runs as a tab in the browser. And you can see that there are a number of folders set up here, as well as individual files. And from this main window, you can uh, create new notebooks, Python 2 or Python 3 notebooks. Uh, you can also create terminals, which gives you give you access to the underlying Unix operating system, and they, the students can run commands from here directly. The notebooks themselves look like this. Here's an example. So here I've written some fairly complicated expression using LaTeX. And, um, there are two different kinds of cells. And if anyone has used Mathematica, you have input and output cells. These IPython notebooks are formatted very similarly. Um, in terms of input cells, you can have markdown cells where you enter text or LaTeX. Uh, and then you have code cells where you actually do computation. So that's the code or formatting code that generates that expression. Mark, can you just speak up just a little bit more? Oh, as a thing hard to hear. Oh, sorry about that. Okay. Uh, so that was an example of a markdown cell. Here's a, an executable code cell. I'll change this just to prove that it actually does a computation. Why are you taking so long? <laughs> <laughs> it may not have connected to the network, actually. That's too bad. Trying to do something. Well, all right, you'll have to take my word for it that, that would actually output six if it were connected to the server properly. Uh, here's a simple plot uh, of x versus x squared. That's, uh, if you're not familiar with Python, uh, Timothy was going to talk more about why Python makes sense as a language to use for these applications, but it's a very simple language to learn, has a nice kind of natural uh, appearance to the syntax. Um, and there are some pretty good resources on the web. It's also open source. Uh, so here's some example exercises. We're asking the students to, uh, they were given a kind of pseudocode algorithm for the second order Runga-Kutta integration method and asked to write the code to implement that. So this cell is all one code cell which implements a function to do that integration and so on. And there's a nice uh, built-in plotting um, library called matplotlib, which will output its results right in the, in the uh, notebook. Okay. Um, various other examples here of computations. There are different kinds of plots uh, one can do. Uh, here's one where they use a relaxation method to determine the electric potential throughout a square uh, where the potential is given on the boundaries. And so they can do a grayscale or a color intensity types of plots. Um, and uh, another example here, which I thought was nice, is a plot that shows the plot string vibrating and it shows it at a uh, specific instance of time. This was given as an extra credit exercise. And as I mentioned, you can incorporate regular images in one of these notebooks just using uh, HTML command, standard HTML. Anyone have any questions about that while I have it up here? <laughs> yeah. And why didn't you use Mathematica? Um, it gives the same capabilities. It gives the same capabilities, but I don't think it's the same programming experience. I think. Mathematica strikes me as more black boxy. 
And I think the syntax is also not similar to other languages the way Python it's is. Not and it's not open source. That was another consideration. Another? Uh, yes. This through uh, animation for any sort of video it, or movie? It can do that. You can embed uh, videos. There are add on packages that you can install that will let you do animations produced from a computation. So not just a video, but anything. Can this be incorporated with the Python? Can you incorporate it for visual? I think there is some package that you can get online that might do that. I'm not entirely sure, Timothy. Did you? I don't know. You might know. I didn't do any animations, but I do know that they're possible today. Yeah. Were these students starting from scratch where they didn't know what an array or a for loop was, or were they starting with some knowledge? As it turned out, many of the Haverford students had had some Python experience uh, prior to the course. I think only one of Bryn Mawr students had had some prior computing experience, programming experience. The others were complete newbies. Mark, maybe mention the zero module. The zero. Uh, yeah, there was an early module in the sequence that was an introduction to Python, basically. And um, I'll say a little bit more about that later on. I discovered as we went through the course that that probably could have used some expanding. But uh, it got them up to speed more or less. What, what sort of group structure did you have in the class? Number of people? Uh, so again, there were 17 students all together. The Haverford students mostly knew each other, and the Bryn Mawr students mostly knew each other, so they broke up into separate tweaks. Um, I think Liz will say a little bit about some of the in class exercises we tried to do to separate them and get them to mix up more. They were only sort of temporarily affected, I would say. Um, they would break up into new groups for the purpose of the exercise and then kind of go back to their standard groups. So if we were going to teach the course again, we'd have to figure out some way to get around that problem. Two, two and three, for the most part. Some students, you know, we encouraged them to work together, but they wanted to work on their own. Yeah. OK, so um, we actually were not using the basic Jupyter system. Uh, we have a computer scientist, Doug Blaine, who's part of our team on the science grant. And he added a number of features to our system, uh, which were very helpful. Some, for example, spell checking and table of contents generation. I didn't use those very much. Uh, but he added two other features which were very useful and which would be, I'm sure he would be glad to provide to anyone who wanted to adopt this system. Uh, these were publishing and submission of notebooks. So in terms of publishing, um, for example, once I wrote up solutions to a set of exercises, I could click on a button in my notebook, and it would send it to a public directory students could then see and download the notebook from to see the solutions to the exercises. Um, submission was a system that Doug implemented for the students to turn in their homework exercises, basically at the top of their notebook window. They had a button they could push. Uh, it would give them then a drop-down list listing the various instructors in the system. And for any particular instructor, there were multiple folders that the student could send their assignment to. And they just select which folder they want to send it to, module two, module three, module four assignment, click the submit button, and it gets sent directly to a folder in my directory, uh, which was a very nice way to collect the student's assignments. Something we talked about that he hasn't, hasn't implemented yet is then a system where I can press a button and send the students graded notebooks back to them. That doesn't exist yet, but it's on Doug's to-do list. Uh, just to give you a sense of the topics that the modules cover, here's a list of them. I'm not going to describe all of them, but I will mention two very quickly. Very quickly. Object-oriented programming, this was something that came up mid-semester. Uh, both Doug and our external advisor on the grant recommended that we introduce object-oriented programming sooner rather than later. So I uh, sort of, together with our external uh, consultants, put together a quick module on object-oriented 
programming. Students ended up really liking it, and some of them used object-oriented stuff in their term projects, so it turned out to be a good choice. Uh, the other thing I want to mention is that a couple of students in the end of the semester feedback said that it would be nice to have a module on how do you work with big data sets and analyze large collections of data. So that's going that's on my to-do list for the future. Uh, here's just a sample kind of exercise that we would have in a notebook asking an example of what we might ask the students to do. So this was in the module on integration. Write a Python function to implement the trapezoidal rule for integration. Apply it to a couple of different functions. Compare with what you expect the answers to be and discuss. Uh, in terms of module feedback, as I said, we regularly ask the students to give us feedback on the modules. Here's an example uh, that I thought was very useful. Most of us are familiar with Gaussian elimination. It would be great to have a quick example there to quickly remind readers who have seen it before what Gaussian elimination method is. And I thought that was really good feedback, and I immediately updated the module to incorporate the feedback. And it's something I'm going to keep in mind as I go through and revamp the modules. Uh, here's another example. I think what would have made this exercise set go a lot smoother would be an index or something with a list of all the skills needed for the exercises. And a number of students gave that kind of feedback that, you know, we had gone through this introduction to Python module early on, but then weeks later they forgot all, much of that stuff. They hadn't used it. So they suggested adding some kind of reminders about Python in the modules, in the end modules themselves, and I thought that was a great idea, which I will implement. These are kind of lessons learned. Uh, I'll just quickly mention, uh, as, again, there's an introductory Python module. I think I need to expand that. Remind the reader of key Python skills needed for the module. Be explicit about the desire, desired function inputs and outputs. Students really don't have that skill in the first learning program. Um, Students new to programming take longer than I expect they'll take to do things. Um, and that was a lesson learned for me. Uh, server implementation, you want a fairly modern computer with a good amount of RAM and swap space in order to have a class of 15 or 20 students be running code on it at the same time. We had some problems with our server bogging down and not working very well. Uh, and in fact, we're planning to migrate the system to our Beowulf cluster which will have a lot more computational power, and I'll be, we have a dedicated Unix person who will be able to maintain it for us. Uh, so the next steps for the modules are expand the introductory module. Um, and we're planning to implement this, this breakup of the modules and put some of them into our introductory physics laboratory in the fall. So we need to decide what modules are going to go into that lab. Um, Term projects, I think since I'm running low on time, uh, I won't say much about this, uh, but the students were given a week in class to work on the term projects. They gave presentations in the last week of classes. Those presentations were graded by the instructors, but we also asked the students' classmates to give them feedback on their presentations. Uh, there was a lot of feedback in the course. Here, an example, here are some examples of term paper, term project topics. Uh, quantum mechanics, hydrodynamics, motions of oscillators and planets, um, modeling mutations of protein molecules, and so on. Okay. So now I'm going to hand it back to Liz. Um, I've been just recently become a student of universal design in pedagogy um, through the lens of this kind of notions of accessibility of of um, education to all students. And maybe some of you have seen this cartoon before. See, there's a picture of a guy shoveling, and there's a ramp on the left and stairs, and, and a student in the wheelchair says, can you shovel the ramp? And he says, uh, all these other kids are waiting to use the stairs. When I'm done with the stairs, I'll shovel the ramp. And then there's the notion that, but if you shovel the ramp, everybody can get it. <laughs> so just this notion of um, learning how to be being thoughtful and then learning strategies for designing courses that don't inadvertently or just because we've always, quote, done it that way, um, uh, 
set up different um, different kind of um, barriers of access. So finding ways to present material, have materials available, ways of um, structuring class activities. Um, often there's a way that's kind of neutral to everyone. Um, and, and spending a little time thinking about that. One of the things um, this grant has gotten us started to think about. And what I want to share with you is that. Nope, we're good. Um, through a collaboration with our Teaching and Learning Institute, um, we were able to read about some of these techniques. We were able to work with student consultants that observed the class and made suggestions to us and um, helped us brainstorm some of the reflection questions that might um, inform us about how this aspect of the class was perceived. Um, so um, the student consultants read and summarized all the journal feedback, which was helpful. They also held one-on-one -on -one interview sessions with the students and provided that feedback to us. They observed the class. Um, and we met with them every two weeks, and they shared with us their observations and any ideas they had from being part of the Teaching and Learning Institute. Um, and um, in some sense, they really helped us be learners in the class as well as the students who were teaching. And this is just a reference to um, Allison Cooks, they're the director of the Teaching and Learning Institute of Vermont, and they have a nice kind of arcade online article about developing culturally responsive, inclusive classrooms, which I think is a subset of the universal design kind of movement. So here are some of the questions we asked. And, and as Mark alluded to, we sometimes did a hurricane where they all sat down with their friends, and then we made them get up and go across the room and not sit next to someone they hadn't talked to before. And then we might ask them uh, one of these questions. So for example, this second one. So couple weeks into the course, maybe a month or so into the course, what do you do when you get stuck with a program not working or not understanding how to maybe get started on implementing a certain algorithm? What resources do you turn to which one have been most useful? This was really great because they first wrote down some things and then they shared with their partner and then they shared with the big group. And we collected a whole bunch of great ideas of the students could learn from one another about what kind of things they did. And of course, you know, uh, what were some of the most popular websites? Overflow, Stack Overflow is a popular place. But some of them said, I, you know, resources in the class, they would talk to a classmate or use Chile, essentially. <laughs> um, this question, some of you might know, is based on research that says if you ask students about what they care about, what they value about, it tends to have a very affirming effect on their confidence. So when you think about young women deciding to take up coding, and one aspect is taking up the coding, which is challenging. The other aspect is to identify as a coder. And there are positive and negative stereotypes about that. Anyways, this exercise was really about setting a tone in the class that um, this was a class for them in the context of their interests and their uh, ability to tackle it and do well. And, um, um, and it turns out the students really liked this activity. It was personal. They didn't share this. They just put it into the uh, uh, journal. And, um, but it really um, allowed that we were really asking them to go ahead and connect this course material with what their interests were and how it related to how they saw themselves as young scientists. Um, then we had some other ones. We really wanted some feedback on whether our profiles were really needing. One of the objectives we had for the profiles was to raise awareness of the diversity of folks that contribute to computer science. Uh, and so we're going to show you some examples, and we were curious whether they thought that, that was actually being accomplished. And then here's another question about um, going forward, how can we use the profiles actually in these modules? And then another question about relating their work and how they intersect with it with their other interests and the other things they were studying. Oh, okay. So Sheila is, is going to take, we thought this might be fun. We're going to show you some of the profiles the students generated themselves and see how well you may know their contributions. Um, this is how we instructed them to um, uh, 
do the profiles and they did them in pairs so we had about uh, we had nine nine profiles the person the context and uh, what was inspirational about their story so Sheila do you want me to just do it for you Sheila put this together so here's five pictures with names and here's some of the compliment accomplishments they made so open it to you Developed the first global hypertext project in 1989, which became a World Wide Web. Who of these five did that? Do you know? I heard Hopper. I heard Bursley. That was Bursley. Yeah. This that was kind of an easy one. How about uh, the first in America to earn a PhD in computer science? I'll go with that one for you. Sister Mary Kenneth Kelly. Anyways, the students got a really good picture. They, of course, reported on a lot more than just these things. But I think I think you you're having the same experience. That there's a lot of folk stories that aren't told in computer science. It's a relatively younger field, and the folks we know, like Bursley, um, just the tip of the iceberg that's really out there. And here's the other set. Oops. There's another set. And I'll just show you which one holds three IBM's original nine PC patents. Anybody know? That's Mark Dean, African American computer science. I think he was educated at Stanford. So we have a number of women, a number of um, African Americans, and some really interesting stories of how they got into computer science. So this, I think the students not only um, uh, learn more about who does computer science, we ask them to keep it contemporary, but also uh, one um, uh, sense of feedback from them was presenting the profiles and watching other people present the profiles. They learned a lot about presentation as well in the class. So we have just a few minutes left, and I thought um, what we would do is um, talk a little bit about some of the feedback we got from students. But so here's some example of reflections on the profiles. We asked them to reflect on the profiles that they saw in addition to the creation. So you can see some of the stories here. <coughs> I like this one. And work reminds me that a physics degree can lead to many things. Um, we had them collect their work into portfolios and then upload them as folders in the um, uh, Jupyter uh, space. We asked them four things. What are the most important things you learned? Valuable takeaways. What, were you, what you, did you do well in the course? What areas do you, would you want to improve? And what topics would you like to learn next? And I thought I just pulled out um, some examples. Some of the themes in these examples, every student, um, uh, many students, I want to say, uh, talked about the peer learning, collaborative nature of learning something like coding. And many students were used to working alone and being successful alone. and. Um, were challenged and appreciated developing skills and working with others. Um, we could see the quotes about troubleshooting, collaboration. Here's the quote about presentation skills and being reflective on her own presentation skills. Uh, you can read a little bit there. I like this one. I learned a good deal about patience, both for my friends and myself. It can be infuriating. And um, so I think this kind of reflection, asking students to do this kind of reflection, um, gives us as instructors insights into how they're really experiencing the demands we're putting on them. But I think as a summative, they wrote these reflections as one part of the e-portfolio. As a summative um, assignment, I think we kind of crystallized for them what they were taking away from the course. Great. I'm just kind of, these are just more things. Some of the takeaways I mentioned before. Just one minute. One minute. Okay, great. Um, Mark mentioned some uh, follow-on activities with the modules. Um, some students wrote about um, 
a desire for creative outlets, um, more control over the aesthetics of what they were producing in their work, the interest in big data techniques came out, the value of uh, presentation opportunities in peer evolution. And of course, to me, my big takeaway is, we, in my mind, we were using a course structure to develop the materials, and we had this goal of disseminating them throughout the day. But the power, especially in this type of learning activity, learning to code, of being in a cohort and having peer learning, and being kind of in this flipped mode of where you're working together to solve um, and do the exercises, and you're doing the background reading outside on your own. To me, it's really a challenge to Maybe this is the one, the one type of the subject that really belongs in a course as opposed to trying to integrate it across the curriculum. So I feel like I've come full circle and now we have to be really creative about if we want to put these modules throughout the major, how do we create that cohort of peer learning environment? So our first inclination is to start out in a lab environment where we have somewhat of a cohort already, but it's not at all in a lecture format. So so we're going to have to solve this problem if we're to meet our objectives. I will um, uh, wrap up there. We had a pre and post survey. Um, the results of this survey are um, not well tested because we haven't done a, um, a statistical test on the differences pre and post. Uh, but it, I wanted to give you a flavor of the kinds of things we're trying to gauge as students work through the course, the modules, the profiles. Are we impacting their self-belief and all that kind of thing. And here's another one. And then finally, here we go. Okay, and we will hold questions till the end. Okay, great, we'll yeah. do the next. Um, tomorrow, if you're interested in this aspect of uh, increasing diversity and equity and pedagogy techniques, there's a workshop tomorrow afternoon, one to four which we'll talk more about those issues. All right, there you.